walking around in a day. Today I stand before you with nothing but praise. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We praise, we praise you. you. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We praise. We praise you. Nobody gets the glory. Oh, Nobody gets the honor. We praise you. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We praise you. We praise away those frowns and those things that had me bound. Thought about all those times when I was walking around in the days. Day I stand before you with nothing but praise. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We praise. We praise oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We praise. We praise oh, Lord. Yeah. That the Lord has made, we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We invite you into the worship service of Bethel African Methodist Church of San Diego. We welcome you into the worship service in your home, in your living room, in your dining room, in your garage, on your job, wherever you are. Grab a friend, grab a family member, grab a neighbor. And come on and worship the Lord with us in spirit and in truth. Come on, praise and worship. Take us up higher. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord we praise you. and beautiful day. We give you praise, Father, because you are worthy. Hallelujah. Let us go to the throne this morning. Oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, Mother. we've come to praise you. Father God, as we praise you, Lord, we thank you for bringing us through. Father God, you brought us through one more week, Lord, and we thank you. Thank you. We praise you this morning because you didn't have to do it. Oh, Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord, with all the confusion, with all the craziness that's going on in this world, Lord. We come to praise you because we know that it's in the palm of your hands. We know, Father God, that you still sit high and you look low, Lord. 
the enemy's having his time right now, Lord, because he knows that you're coming back, Lord. So we want to thank you this morning because you continue to keep your love, your loving arms wrapped around us this morning, Father. Oh, Father God, we just want to just thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for caring about us, Father God, even though when we slip and fall, Lord, because you're there to pick us up. Oh, Father God, we just praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Father God, as I look this morning at the bulletin, I see our sick and shut-in members, Lord. The list has grown, Father, but Father God, I know that you're the master physician. I know that you've never lost a case, Lord. So I'm asking you not right, Lord, Lord, to touch each member that's on that sick and shut-in list this morning, Father God. Healing from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, Lord. Oh, Father God, we know that you're able, Lord. Oh, Father God, we just praise you right now, Lord, because we see a victory in healing, Lord. I'm asking for victory in healing this morning, Father God, not just for our sick and shut on this, Lord. I'm asking for a healing of this nation. We need a healing right now, Lord. We need to stop the racial craziness is going on father god father god we are supposed to be all your people lord so i'm just asking you father god for that healing power right now lord we know that your spirit is in the house right now father we're asking that your holy spirit would touch our pastor this morning father oh father god give him the preached word father that will prick someone's heart this morning that will help touch somebody father god that doesn't know you this morning lord and Father God, for those of us that do know you, Lord, we need to hear a word from you this morning, Father. We need to hear a word from you, Father God, to help uplift our spirits, Lord, to help keep us keeping on, Father God, as we run this Christian race, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. We lift you up because you are worthy, Lord, of the praise. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and for all that you're about to do. All this we ask in the precious, precious, the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Can we just, can we just lift our voices today thank you. in praise? Whatever the thank praise you. is on your thank lips, you. whatever the praise is on thank your you. lips, can we just praise him? Praise him. Yes. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Oh, for what he's done for you. We don't have to look back too far either because he woke us up this morning. Yes. Amen. Amen. In the midst of the season that we're in, we can still shout a praise to him. Oh, you should always wake up with a praise on your heart and a praise on your lips because he's been too good and too kind. Thank you, God. Yes.
unto the pouring Wonderful Savior Jesus, Jesus, my healer Jesus, Jesus, my anointing Jesus, Jesus, blessed Savior, blessed Savior. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2 and verse 2, excuse me, chapter 2 verses 18 through 26. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Therefore I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what has man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. Nothing is better for a man that he should, than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and doing of his holy word. Amen. Pleasure to read for you from the New King James Version, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, and we'll begin reading at verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, Hmm, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Saul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and 
be Mary. But God, <laughs> but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The word of God for the very people of God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. As this awesome choir prepares some giving music, we've come to that time in the worship service where we sh can all share in and participate in, in giving. There are four different ways in which you can give. From your mobile devices, you can download the Givelify mobile giving app and then search for Bethel AME of San Diego. You can go to Bethel's website, www.bethelamesd.com. Click on giving and follow the prompts. You can also mail your offerings to Bethel AME Church, 3085 K Street, San Diego, California, 92102. And then for the members of this great church, you can drop off your offerings, your tithes and offerings, Tuesday through Friday, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Thank you. And now, will this great choir give us some offering music? Father, we thank you for those who are able to will give, give according to your direction and your guidance. We thank you, Father, for this offering, for the upbuilding of your kingdom, to the honor and glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we say all things come 
of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. We thank you for blessing this offering to do what you know needs to be done for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Oh! 
alright. All right now. Think I'll make it. Think I'll make it. Anyhow. Anyhow. It's alright. All right now. I think I'll make it. I'll make it. Anyhow. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's going to be all right now. I think I can make it anyhow. We're in the midst of a pandemic. Five months in, I heard the choir say, I'm going to make it. Some people got their unemployment cut. I heard the choir say, I'm going to make it. Some people got a pink slip. I heard the choir say, I'm going to make it. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. And it's all right now. We're going to run on and see what the end is going to be. Amen. So I want to thank God this morning for these marvelous musicians playing to the glory and honor of our God. I want to thank you, our dynamic director, Brother Ricky Jackson. They call him Bishop. Does an outstanding job. The brother on these is Hammond, David Dredden, tickling these keys over here. And I thank God for the praise and worship team that continues to remind us in the midst of all this mess that's going on that we're going to be all right, y'all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus, we, your sons and daughters, have assembled in this holy place to worship you in spirit and in truth. Many are in their homes watching this worship service, anxiously anticipating a word from on high. Now, Father God, we need a word from you this morning. We need a fresh word, a rima word that's going to destroy yokes and set the captives free. So please take the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and may it be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord, if there be any that are not saved, that hear this message or see it, prick their heart that they may come saying, what must I do to be saved? Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I know you're in the house, but go to the homes that are viewing or listening to this worship service. Go in the living rooms, in the dining rooms, in the rehab centers, nursing homes, physical therapy centers. Touch heal, strengthen, restore, and just stop by and sup with us today, Lord. We'll be careful to give you praise, honor, and glory. Save some and send some, and we'll give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, my brothers and sisters, I want to call our attention to an Old Testament prophet. His name is Jeremiah, and they call him the weeping prophet. If you read his story, beginning to end, you'll see exactly why he's been given the name the weeping prophet. In the eighth chapter of Jeremiah, I'd like to read for your hearing verses 20 through 22. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment is taking hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the help? of the daughter of my people. This morning, my brothers and sisters, I just want to preach for your hearing just for a few moments. There is a balm in Gilead. There is a balm in Gilead. And the 
focus of the message this morning is verse 22 when the prophet Isaiah asked the question, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Again, my brothers and sisters, the message this morning is there is a balm in Gilead. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet. And as Jeremiah concerned himself with the judgment of the people of Judah, as he looked around at their plight, as he considered how far they had gotten from God, as the prophet Jeremiah considered all that the Lord God had done for them, brought them out of the land of Egypt, put them into a promised land flowing with milk and honey. They moved into cities that they didn't build. They got vineyards that they didn't plant. And even if you look at the story of the children of Israel, when they left out of Egypt, they didn't leave out poor because they left out after they plundered the Egyptians. The Lord told them to go and get silver and gold and fine linen from the Egyptians. So when the Israelites left Egypt, they went in as about 72 people and they came out millions. They ended up being slaves, but they came out being free. They went in without much, but they came out very wealthy. And even as they entered into the land of promise, God did exactly what he said that he would do for them. The land that was theirs, he gave it to them to possess. They had to fight for it, but it was theirs. And that's a lesson for all of us. Sometimes when God gives us something, just because he gives us the promise, don't think that you won't have to fight for it. He gave you a wife. He gave you a husband. He gave you sons and daughters. Don't think that because God gave them to you, that you're not going to have to fight for your husband, fight for your wife, fight for your son, and fight for your daughters. So after all that the Lord God had done for the children of Israel, after he had delivered them out of bondage, delivered them into the land of promise, allowed them to conquer their enemies somewhere along the way, they got puffed up in pride, even though Moses told them. Now, when you go into this land that's flowing with milk and honey, take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses told the children of Israel, remember when you get into the land that it was the Lord who brought you up and not you yourselves. The children of Israel did what many of us do when God blesses us. Initially, we give God the credit, but along the way, we start trying to take credit or the glory of God for what he did for us. I've talked to so many people that consider themselves to be self-made individuals. Reverend, nobody helped me. I did it all myself. My mom and daddy didn't have much money. They just put me on the bus and told me to go to school. They didn't have any money to give me, and I went, and I made it. Oftentimes, they fail to mention those care packages they got in the mail. Spam, ramen noodles, pork and beans, a card with $5 in it. Those fives and tens add up. And believe you me, a college student loves to get care packages with those ramen noodles a little spam and whatever else you can put on it and put some green in it if you send it to them. No one has made it anywhere by themselves. Wherever you may be, it's because of the grace of God. You didn't do it by yourself. 
The weeping prophet Jeremiah, his heart is broken. And he's preaching to a people who are not listening. He's preaching a message that they don't necessarily want to hear. When the prophet of God begins to speak truth to power, very often you will be speaking to people who have itching ears, which means they just want to hear what makes them feel good. This is my 30th year in ministry, and it's very interesting that most of the time people don't write me letters about messages that have challenged them to change their life. But when a message drives down their street, gets into their driveway, pulls up into their garage, believe you me, I've gotten letters from some folk. Reverend, now you don't have to talk about that shacking thing. You can leave that alone. Guess who's sending me letters when I preach about shacking? The one who's shacking. I've gotten letters, Reverend. You know that, that uh, you can stay away from that LGBTQI thing. You can just leave that alone. Who you think send me letters about that? Now, when I preach about gossip, no letter. When I preach about adultery, no letter. But when your particular sin happens to come up, and when people feel the pressure from the word of God that encourages us, commands us to change, turn from our wicked ways, very often people get tight when the sermon applies to their lifestyle. So tithing sermons don't impact tithers. But it's the ones that are making all kind of excuses why they can't give their first 10% to God, but they give their money to the cable company first. It's the one that complains that they can't pay a tithe, but they pay their mortgage first. The same one that complains they can't pay the tithe makes sure that everything else gets paid, and then the leftovers, I'm going to give this to God. But every morning when we open up our eyes, we expect the brand new mercies of God to fall fresh upon us. Every morning when you walk outside of your house, you want the same sun that's shining on my head, shining on my face, to shine on your face. Every time that we make a mistake and we have to say, Father, I'm sorry, please forgive me. We want God's grace to be sufficient to us but it's interesting that so often with all that God does for us instead of giving him our best and what's first we give God the leftovers after we gave everything that we had to husband or wife we give God the leftovers after you work in your secular job not one hour two hours but double shifts then you come to the church and give the leftovers to the church. Reverend, I would be there, but you know I got to work this devil. I would be there, but I'm going to go pick up this cash working this other job. Well, I want you to take care of your family, but Pete, let's make sure that we keep the things of God in the proper perspective. God first, then family. God first, then husband. God first, then wife. God first, then son or daughter. God first, then your job. God first, then your church. God first. And so the prophet, as he looked around and saw all that was happening to his people, he began to preach out of a deep ache, extreme pain, suffering that was caused by someone that has the ability to not sympathize but to empathize with the very plight of people. Some individuals have a very unique gift. Some call it a gift and others call it a curse. They have the ability to actually feel another person's pain. They can literally walk in another person's moccasins as the Native Americans say. They don't just sympathize when they see that your loved one has died. 
They have the actual ability because God has given it to them. They can literally feel your hurt. They can feel your pain. They know how heartbreaking it is when someone that you're supposed to love for the rest of your life comes home and says, I don't love you anymore. I found somebody new. They know what it feels like. Have you ever felt pain for somebody else who did not know the Lord or who would not obey him? Have you ever considered the plight of somebody else who is walking outside of the ark of the covenant of safety that comes along with being saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost? As Jeremiah looked at his people, he was concerned because there were false prophets that were lying to them about the captivity that they were facing. You know, there's always going to be some false prophet. They call themselves prophesying. Many times they're prophesying. They tell people what they want to hear, not what thus saith the Lord. If you look closely at the story of the Israelites, the Israelites were being afflicted by a foreign nation. God was doing exactly what he said he would do. He told them that if they forsook him and followed after the pagan gods of their neighbors, that he would allow foreign nations to chastise them. And now we see the children of Israel being taken into captivity by this Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah saw that Nebuchadnezzar was an instrument in the divine hand of God. He was a wicked king, a pagan king. He, even though he was a pagan king, he was the means by which God's people would be brought to judgment for their sins. Stick a pen in that for a minute. Look at the person that's occupying the White House right now. And I know that we got people even in this congregation that voted for 45. But I decree and declare I've never seen our country in the shape that it's in as it is right now. America is supposed to be the wealthiest nation in the world. And I saw just yesterday on the news, 46 states will not be able to count all of the vote mail-in ballots from the post office. In the United States of America, the greatest country in the world, you mean to tell me that our postal service has been moving mail for all these hundreds of years, now all of a sudden, when we are talking about voting, mailing in votes, so that people don't get sick with the COVID-19, you mean to tell me now all of a sudden the post office cannot do their job, which their job is to move the mail, but because we have an occupier in the White House that's working with the Russians, and I said it, and I'm going to say it again, that's working and colluding with Putin to steal the election and make our country a banana republic, now, all of a sudden, he puts a man in office who has never even worked in the post office, can't tell you how to put a stamp on an envelope, can't tell you how a letter gets from Oceanside to San Diego, can't tell you how a letter gets from Palmdale to L.A., can't tell me how a letter can get from St. Louis to Seattle. All of a sudden, you put a man in office over the postal system in the most critical election in our lifetime, it looks like we have a pagan king in office, a wicked king that God has put in power to bring his people back to their senses. I've been hearing it all week. If my people that are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, then I will heal their land. I'm going to hear from heaven. I'm going to heal their land. And I'm going to save their soul. Don't trouble yourself with who's in the White House. 
He's only there for a little while. Don't trouble yourself with who's in the governor's house. And I love our governor, but it's all right. He can't control what's going on. Don't trouble yourself with who's in the mayor's house. As a matter of fact, our mayor's a lame duck. Mayor Faulkner only has a little bit of time left. And yes, I said it, he's a lame duck. Don't put your trust in the White House. Don't put your trust in the governor's house. Don't even put your trust in your pastor's house. Look to the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, realized that there were some prophet liars out there. And so he decided that he was going to prophesy to the people and tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I just stopped by to tell somebody today that the same way it was in the days of Jeremiah is just like that today. These United States of America are so ununited, if you will. We're supposed to be the United States of America. And now in a, in a pandemic, in a time when we should be walking in lockstep together, black and white, Jew and Gentile, male and female, straight and gay, all need to be walking in lockstep together saying we shall overcome someday. We shall overcome systematic racism someday. We're going to overcome COVID-19 someday. And the prophet stopped by to tell them, and he's telling us today, don't concern yourself so much with the international politics that are happening. God's got that all in control. Don't concern yourself so much with the affairs of the state and the procedures of government. So what? They went home and they didn't vote to do something more for the people. God still has it all under control. And so even while the congressmen are going home and even while the senators are going home, I just stopped by to tell somebody that not just my help, but your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the, the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. It's not on Donald Trump. But it's on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And I'm glad that Kamala Harris is Biden's presidential, vice presidential nominee. But I want to tell somebody, my hope is not even built on Biden. As much as I like Kamala, my hope is not built on Kamala. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Jeremiah found out what some of us are still finding out. This world has a problem, and the real problem is sickness. We have a sin sickness that's happening all over this planet. There's sin in, all up, and through this place. There's sin in the White House. There's sin in the Governor's House. There's sin in the British Parliament. There's sin in Russia. There's sin in Saudi Arabia. There's sin in Jerusalem. There's sin in Islam. There's sin in every nation. There is sin. And so there's nothing that can cure the ill and will of mankind. There's no pill that you can pop. There's no drink that you can drink. There's no smoke that you can smoke. We are all manipulated and victimized again and again by shrewd people sinful people that separate us, divide us based on race, based on gender, based on class, based on the haves and the have-nots. And so right now we have people that are telling folk that if you have sun-kissed skin like mine, you have no business being in the room. We have people that say if your skin is as white as this tile, you have the right to make every decision and you should get everything that you have coming to you. We have people that are separating us based on where we live. You live on this side of the tracks and I live on this side of the tracks and since I grew up over there 
and you grew up over here, these two shall never meet. Your people had money, and my people grew up in poverty. And since my people were poor and yours were rich, we have a right to make the laws that are going to impact your life. Since you grew up in a poor neighborhood and your tax base is a little lower, we can put you in schools that have a pipeline to prison. We can track what's happening with third graders and build prisons for black and brown people. Sin is everywhere that you look around. The cure for sin is not legislation. The cure for sin is not another prison. The cure for sin is a savior that can apply a balm of Gilead. Some people try and make it sound all nice. Some people try and clean it up and be politically correct. But if you really want to know what's wrong with these Americas, North America, South America, if you really want to know what's wrong with this planet, it's more than climate change. We need a change on the inside of our hearts. Men and women need to love one another. Boys and girls need to be more forgiving of one another. Husbands and wives need to be more loving to one another. Sons and daughters need to be more forgiving to their parents. Is there a bomb in Gilead? Yes, there is. We need healing from on high. Jeremiah would tell us that this sin-sick disease that we're dealing with, it destroys the nervous system. It destroys the conscience. It destroys our families. It binds the strong man. It destroys the strong woman. And the thing about it is this sin-sick nature has been a part of humanity for a very long time. He showed up in the Garden of Eden and after God made everything and said it is good, Satan showed up. We don't know how long that he was talking to Eve, but he talked to her long enough that she was tempted to eat from the tree. And when she ate and gave it to her husband, then their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. Sin came into the world through Adam, not through Eve, brothers. I know we try and give the women a bad rap and say they ate first, but if you look back in Genesis, you and I will see that sin did not come into the world until Adam ate because the covenant that was made was made with Adam. There is no Eve covenant. There's an Adamic covenant because God told Adam, you can eat from every tree except for this one. And you know, my brothers and sisters, I've talked to some people that have said, well, Harvey, if God is God, then why would he put that in the middle of the garden? Out of everything that he did, he didn't have to do that to them. And I have to tell people when they run that garbage by me, God can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do how he wants to do it. And if you look at the account, he said everything you have access to. But this one thing belongs to me. God is not stingy or selfish. He gave them access to everything in the garden. And if he said it's mine, don't mess with it. It belongs to me. He was within his right to set the line and tell them what line that they should not cross. And so Jeremiah realized that the people of God were struggling in sin. He saw the awful symptoms of this dreaded sinful disease. If you look at the beginning of the 8th chapter, he starts out saying the bones of kings, princes, priests, prophets, and citizens shall become as dung, fertilizer on the face of the earth. He went on to say that death shall be chosen in preference to life, the people had begun to backslide. They turned away from God. They walked in ways that were not pleasing in his sight. They were sliding backwards. And even though he sent them prophets, they refused to listen to the true prophet of God. Some had introduced false cures, which 
as Jeremiah said, healed the hurt of the people only slightly. Many confused and deceived by crying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. And people did worse things and were not even ashamed. They didn't even blush at the most terrible outbreak. And the prophet, the crying, weeping prophet, Jeremiah, starts speaking. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. For the hurt of my people, I am hurt. I am black. I mourn in sackcloth and ashes. Astonishment has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of my daughter, of the people recovered? This is a question that a lot of people are asking even today. Why do people that are saved die with COVID-19? Why do people that are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, still get cancer? Why in the world is somebody that preaches and teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ still end up with prostate cancer? Why in the world, with all that is happening, would God not protect his people from this dreaded disease called COVID-19. I think people all over the globe are saying, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there a physician there? Jeremiah was referring to a balm which was found in the ancient times. The Ishmaelites and the Arabian merchants brought this balm among their cargo in their camel caravans. And I read that this powerful aromatic balm was taken to Israel and it was credited with marvelous cures. This balm from Gilead reached diseases that were otherwise beyond the power of the ancient doctors. The worst and most painful dreaded diseases were not even beyond the reach of the balm of Gilead. So the prophet cried for some spiritual balm in Gilead, which would get down into the hearts of the people and cure them of their sin sickness. There are several qualities that we read about from this balm which suggests to us healing that is available to us through Jesus the Christ. First thing we notice about this balm is that it did not grow in Palestine. It came from a land east of Jordan, from Gilead. It had to be brought into the land from elsewhere. No plant grew naturally in Palestine, which was effective as a balm no plant grew like the balm of Gilead. There was no plant in Palestine that had the power to cure the inhabitants of the diseases which they were facing. As we consider the sin sickness of our souls, there's no earthly balm, no human cure, which will get to the seat of this disease called sin. Sin has no mortal cure, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Sin has no mortal cure. Sin can't be healed by your education. Sin can't be healed by your wallet or your purse. Education makes the sickness of sin more subtle and more deadly. Wealth makes the disease of sin more resourceful. Culture makes this sickness more polished and more sophisticated. We got a lot of sophisticated sinners that dress it up. They look good 
They drive certain cars. They wear certain clothes. They live in certain communities. They even part of certain fraternities and sororities. All the right situations. But if you really look closely at their life, all the stuff that dresses it up, it's just polished. They're still sinners. Prisons make the disease more vicious. Recreation makes this sickness of sin more vigorous and more subtle. Nothing grown here on earth can take away this disease of sin. We have a bomb that will cure the sin-sick soul. Thank you, Jesus. And it was imported from another land. No one on earth could save us. For such a one to come, the prophets long and the priests ministered in hope and in countless altars. The cure for our sin sick souls came down through 42 generations. When the Father and the Holy Spirit looked around, questioned the heavenly host, and said, who can go for us and who can we send? No seraphim was worthy. No cherubim was worthy. The archangel was not worthy. There was only one that was worthy. After they said, who will go for us and who can we send? The one that spoke up is named Jesus. He said, here am I, send me, Father. And I can look at it in my sanctified imagination. And I can see God saying, son, I, I, I know that you can do the job, but I don't want to send you. Because I know what they're going to do to you. You know, they've killed all my prophets. And I love you more than anything or anyone. I don't want to send you. They've killed my prophets. They've killed the priests. Everybody that I've sent in my name, they've killed. And I can hear Jesus saying, here am I, send me. And so Jesus came through 42 generations in the fullness of time, right when the time was right. He came just in the nick of time. Jesus, the water walker, came to the earth, the one who has the power to heal our diseases, the balm of Gilead, to take away the sins of the whole world. No wonder the angel said, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. No wonder when John the Baptist saw him, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. There was no one anywhere, not just on this earth, but even outside of this earth, that could do what we needed done. We needed our sins taken away. And there was only one who could do that. And his name was Jesus. There's another quality of the balm of Gilead, which resembles Jesus, who is the healing for our sin-sick souls. I read that the balm tree was not a tree of beauty or attractive. It was not a stately tree. It did not grow large limbs, which would grant it great beauty. The tree in Gilead, from which the healing balm was extracted, really was an unattractive tree. It was not even favorably looked upon like some huge oaks or some of the redwoods that we have out here in California. It was a light and gummy type of tree. Its wood was light and gummy. It was not capable of being polished into a beautiful mahogany. The healer of our soul's hurt was not so attractive when he came here that people were falling all over him because of his handsomeness or his beauty. No, no, that was not the case. As a matter of fact, even in his own hometown, he could not do a great work because they didn't even believe that he had the power to do what he was sent here to do. All of us who are hurting with sin right now and want to be healed, but you keep looking for something that's pretty and attractive, 
Some people are going and buying those crystals, setting them up on their table, praying to a crystal and hoping that a crystal will heal you. The crystal has no power. Some people are going to 1-800-PSYCHIC-HOTLINE, hoping that a psychic can give you a reading and tell you when the COVID-19 is going to end. But the psychic does not have the answer for you. Some people are scrolling in the pages in the newspaper looking at their horoscope, and it should be horoscope, trying to find out what the stars are telling them is their healing and where they could get it from. But I just stopped by to tell somebody that I don't care if you look at all the crystals in the world, you'll never find one like Jesus. I don't care if you go to all the so-called psychics. They are not the author and the finisher of our faith. And I don't care what number that you dial or what newspaper that you read. Whatever is in that horoscope can't tell you to run on and see what the end is going to be. So I just stopped by to tell somebody today that the government cannot heal us, nor itself. The government can't heal us. The schools cannot heal your soul. And as sad as it sounds, and I hate to say it, even many of our churches cannot heal your sin-sick soul. Many of our priests and preachers can't heal your sin-sick soul. For those who live under the ether, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, there's no other name under heaven by which men, women, boys, and girls should be, must be, can be saved. That name is Jesus. He is the lily of the valley. He is the bright in the morning star. He is water when you're thirsty. He is bread when you're hungry. He will be the balm of Gilead for your sin sick soul. There is a balm in Gilead for our sin sick soul. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I've got one more example of the healing medicine that was in the balm tree. As I read more about this balm tree of Gilead, I realized that the healing was not in the root of the bark as it is in the sassafras tree. The healing power of the balm tree is released in one way. The healing balm that's in the balm tree of Gilead has to be released through cutting and piercing the tree until it bleeds. And when you cut and pierce the balm tree of Gilead, the tree begins to bleed. And as you cut the tree, some healing comes forth out of that tree. There is a balm in Gilead to heal our sin sick soul. And just like the balm tree in Gilead had to be cut, it had to be cut so that the fluid could bleed out. It had to be cut so that the healing power could be released. When Christ went to Calvary one day, when he allowed them to hang them high, and yes, he allowed them, he said, no man takes my life. I'm laying it down, but I also have the power to pick it back up. One day, Jesus, the water walker, one day, Mary's little lamb, one day, the baby that had been wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. One day they hung him high. They stretched him wide. And just like the balm tree in Gilead, if you want the power of healing to go forth out of that balm tree, you've got to cut it so that it could bleed 
And when it bleeds, the blood that comes forth will be healing to the sin-sick soul. When they hung him high and they stretched him wide, they pierced him in the side, something happened on Calvary's cross. The sun refused to shine. It got so dark that it's a darkness that we've never seen before. He stayed on the cross some three, four hours. But then, when they put him in a borrowed tomb, I read that he got up with all power in his hand. When they pierced him in his side, blood and water poured out of his side. The balm in Gilead that was bruised for our iniquity wounded for our transgressions and by his stripes we are healed his name is Jesus the lily of the valley Jesus the bright in the morning star Jesus the water walker Jesus my heart fixer Jesus my mind regulator Jesus the cure for all our soul's diseases. Jesus is a balm in Gilead. Yes, there is a balm in Gilead. I'm not worried about 45. He's going to do what he's going to do. But at the end of the day, my God and your God, Jesus, the one who sits high and looks low, Jesus, will apply the balm of Gilead to your heart and to my heart. Jesus will heal the COVID-19 virus. Jesus will bring peace in the midst of this sin-sick culture. Jesus, if you want to know how we get over this systematic racism, you can't legislate a person's heart or mind. People's hearts and minds are going to have to have a little touch from the master. And when Jesus puts his hand in people's hearts, then the one that are talking about Jews will not replace us, will be calling on the name of Jesus. The one that looks at me and curses me because I have sun-kissed skin will start to call me their brother. Jesus the lily of the valley, Jesus, the bright and morning star, Jesus, healing for your sin-sick soul, Jesus, will heal the pimp, Jesus, will heal the prostitute, Jesus, will save the homeless man, Jesus, can save the homeless woman, Jesus, can save the one that's smoking dope, Jesus can save the one that's shooting dope. Jesus can touch the mind of the schizophrenic. Jesus can regulate the mind of the bipolar. Jesus can reconcile broken marriages. Jesus can bring your wayward child home. Jesus can speak truth to power. Jesus can clean up the government. Jesus can tell Mitch McConnell to sit down. Jesus can tell Nancy Pelosi, chill out. Jesus can tell Gavin Newsom, I got this. Jesus can tell 45, go take a hike. Jesus can tell you no matter what it looks like, I've got all power in my hands. I sit high, I look low. I have not forgotten you. I am the bomb in Gilead. I am the one that has the power. I am the one that has your healing. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If you want your mind to get right, if you want your house to get right, if you want your sin soul to get right, put your trust in God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 
David said, when my mom and daddy forsake me, Jesus will pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, Nothing. but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. For me, one day when I was lost, he died until the sun refused to shine. He died. He died. But on the third day, he got up with all power in his hand. Power to heal the sin sick soul. Power to set the captives free. Power to send this virus back to the depths of hell. Power over cancer. Power over HIV. Power over loneliness. Power, power, Holy Ghost power. There is a bomb in Gilead. Put your trust in him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Open up your mouth. Say glory. Glory to God in the highest. Open up your mouth. Give God the praise. Praise him until heaven gets in a hurry. Praise him until the power falls. Praise him until your heart gets right. Praise him until your mind gets right. Praise him from whom all blessings flow. Praise him in your living room. Praise him in your dining room. Praise him. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If God has done something good for you, open up your mouth. Tell somebody, I know it was the Lord. He brought me out. I know it was God. He saved me. I know it was God. He healed me. When I wanted to lose my mind, he kept me. Won't he do it? I know he will. Jesus is a keeper. He'll keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless that wonderful name. Power in the name of Jesus. Healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. There's no other name under the earth. There's no other name. Buddha can't save you. Mohammed can't save you. Confucius can't save you. Jesus, marriage baby. Jesus, bless his name. Hallelujah. There is. There is a balm. There is a balm in Gilead that can save your sin sick soul. My brothers and sisters, somebody may have been listening or watching this service. You've been trying to handle this thing yourself. I don't care how good you think you are. You're still a sinner. I don't care what good work you do. You can't work your way into a relationship with Christ. I'm going to tell you what he did. 
See, God knows hum humanity. If this was done where you could write a check, it'd be a whole lot of saved folk that didn't do anything but write a check. But that would also be a way to exclude people. There would be some people in the kingdom that redlined it, like some banks used to do black folks. Put a red line around the neighborhood and say, we're not loaning no money to these people. Well, if it was up to us, we might put that kind of qualification on salvation. You want to get in here, you got to write a check. Some people don't have a check. God said, I'm going to take that off the table. If it was for some people, they would say, you got to be in this frat or this sorority. If you want to be saved, you got to be a part of us. He took that off the table. You got to be black, white, yellow, some other, whatever. I don't know what other color it could be, but whatever it is, you got to be that. But he said, I'm taking that off the table. You got to be a Jew. I'm taking that off the table. Thank you, Jesus. This is how simple he made it, and this is where the enemy gets us. First of all, hear me loud and clearly. All have sinned and come short, fallen short of the glory of God. All beings all. Secondly, the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. We deserve death for our sinfulness. But the gift, the gift of God is salvation. And I'm going to tell you, this is how simple he made it. it I, this is why I love Jesus. When I was not saved, I did so much foul stuff. My prayer was, Lord, if you can take these sins away, I'm going to share this with you. This is my testimony. And I'm a PK. I was raised in the church. From 14 to 21, I can count the times that I actually went into a building of a church. And one day, the Lord grabbed me. And he said, it's time for you to come back. And I heard him. And as I came back, I knew I was not worthy even of being called his son. I really was the prodigal son, like so many of you may have been. But do you know when I said, Lord, if you can just take this guilt of all this garbage away, all the lies, all the cheating, all the mistreating of people, all the foul, terrible stuff I did that I was no longer doing, but I couldn't get rid of the guilt. I went to the altar, and I tell you, Something miraculous happened. All of that filth, all of that dirt, all that nastiness that I had been engaged in when I kneeled at the altar in prayer, the Lord took it. Everything I did, he took it. And then I did something that my sister and I used to laugh at people. My dad was a preacher. When he get through preaching and do the invitation, people come down there crying, and we be joking, laughing, talking about it. I don't know what they crying for. And I said, I would never do that. I don't know why those people go down there crying. My God. Let me tell you what happened to me. The day that I accepted Christ as my Savior, when I felt, literally felt the weight lifted, then my heart melted. Yeah. And here I am. I was younger then, guys. I was a strong guy. This big, strong guy, he said, I don't know what they crying for. I start crying like a baby. My God. It's like the waterfall went on. I couldn't turn it off. But let me tell you something. I didn't care who saw me. Because right. I know what God did for me on that day. He saved me. He took all that guilt. He became the balm of Gilead for my sin sick soul. Thank you. So I want to share this with somebody. Because I think people need to understand this. First of all, Satan is a liar. And he's the father of lies. Yeah. He does not want you to get saved. He hates humanity. He's going to do everything he can to keep you from receiving. This is a gift. If you want to be saved, we're going to step on the devil's head. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died and rose again, you shall be saved. Confess and believe. So I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. Now listen, you can repeat these words after me, but you also got to believe them in your heart. You can say it in an audible voice or silently. Pray this prayer with me if you want to be saved. Dear Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my iniquity. Lord, I believe 
that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died and rose again. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I surrender my will to you. Have you prayed that prayer? You are saved. You are guaranteed a seat in eternity. I don't care what happens to you from this day forward. You're saved. Now you will sin again. All you have to do is ask the Lord for forgiveness. If you prayed that prayer and you're not a member of Bethel Church or you're still looking at us, you need to get connected to a church where you can be preached to, prayed with, and where you can get in a Bible study in Sunday school. So we're going to give someone an opportunity at this time to unite with this great church. Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church of San Diego, I would love to be your pastor. We have some of the greatest Christians in the kingdom of Christianity. So at this time, my brothers and sisters, if you want to be members of the church, you can call 619-232-0510, and we will welcome you in. You can also go to our website, and you, there's information on the site. Leave your name, number, and email. We will contact you. A couple of things I want to say briefly before we have our benediction. I want to thank everyone for the birthday celebration. Please forgive me. Last week, it was so much on my mind. I meant to say it. I didn't. It was the best birthday I've ever had. I was blown away. Thank you for the love that you showed me on my birthday and also the love you showed my wife and I for our anniversary. Thank you. Bethel, you are the best church in all the land, and I mean that with all my heart. Our deepest sympathies go out to Kadera and Elena McDaniels, grandmother, uh, their grandmother passed, Pearlie Morgan, August 11th, COVID-19. Please pray for that family. Our evangelist, Yvette McMillan's sister, Elizabeth Carmen of Minneapolis, passed on August 13th. You're in our prayer, Sister Yvette. Please keep her lifted up in prayer. Sister Ida Williams, cousin, Gloria Pearlie of San Diego, passed after an extended illness. Sister Barbara Odom's long-term friend, Jim Perrier of Arizona, passed, and his wife is going into treatment for cancer. Please pray for her. That's the Perrier family. And we also need prayer for the family of Martha Bailey. Uh, she's gone from labor to reward. The Bailey family needs our family along with Tatiana in the loss of her grandmother. Now, my brothers and sisters, we have a lot of prayer requests on our sick and shut-in. I certainly want you to keep praying for Brother Fred, Freddie Bevelin. Please continue lifting up Brother Billy Jones. And by the way, Bill Jones was here for the food distribution this week. Your prayers are being answered. Bill and his lovely wife, Cynthia, were here. I want you to continue praying for Bill. Please lift up. Sister Peggy Means, Louis Pickney, Francis Pickney's husband, Victor Pippins needs our prayers, Carl Hunter needs our prayers, and Penny Vales Williams, and also Sheila Watts. There's several members. Look in your program when you get an opportunity, when you say your daily prayers. Please remember our sick and shut in. There is a balm in Gilead. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy, Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in each and every one of our hearts. May the people of God say amen. We'll see you next week. God bless you. God keep you. Let the church say amen. Let the church say Go a little up tempo with that. Pick that up, please. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the 
Hello, Bethel. I am Dr. G on behalf of Pastor Vaughn. Today is August 1st, 2020, and this is our 12th COVID-19 update. I'm here with my son, Jaden, who will be producing this presentation. It's been almost a month since we last met, and a lot has happened since that time. Nationwide, as seen in our first graphic, we have surpassed the 150,000 deaths, of which this is about 23% of the world's reported deaths. Total reported cases of COVID-19 in the United States exceeds 4.5 million. In California, after reopening just over a month ago, the numbers began to spike. This led to a quick rollback and many of the services we began to enjoy again were taken away because of the high spiking numbers. Let's look at the data a little closer by age. Look at the trends in this chart and you can see that, relatively speaking, kids under the age of 10 have very little disease. You'll see that their death rates are zero. The same goes for those between the age of 10 and 19, very low incidence of disease, though not as low as zero to nine, still extremely low. And again, death rates are not present. There is a condition that I discussed with you a few presentations ago called multi-system inflammatory syndrome that affects kids who develop COVID-19 infections. As it turns out, that disease process is not as bad as we thought it might be with only about two kids per 100,000 getting this complication. That's very encouraging. So this does not appear to be a, a limiting factor in getting our kids, kids back to school and other activities. Recent data, however, is concerning. We know there's a high viral load or num number of viral particles in the nasal passages in some kids. This might lead to a higher infectious rate that is transmitting from kids to others, but we don't know that yet. In fact, some small studies suggest kids don't infect people as much as adults, but that data is very preliminary. As seen in this chart, however, Sandhill County as well as worldwide, the vast majority of deaths are in people over the 60, age of 60, making up 87% of all deaths. The vast majority of those people having coexisting disease. Again, looking at this chart, no deaths under the age of 20. Why am I focusing on age group today? It's very simple. As a nation, we're facing a fundamental problem. Our kids are not getting educated the way they need. This is essential to our kids' future, particularly kids of color. The problem with reopening schools, however, goes far beyond our children. Remember that about 57% of San Diego adults have coexisting disease, thereby are at higher risk for complications if they get COVID-19. So these very people make up the teachers and administrators and others such as janitors and essential workers that keep our schools running. They have to be protected. So we have to do the things to minimize them developing the disease process. Not to mention the risk of taking the disease back home to parents and grandparents who could then die from this disease since they are the highest risk people. Another thing that has been very difficult for us is understanding how to, to teach our kids. We know that teachers have not been shown how to do online teaching effectively and even when they do teach effectively, it's hard to do so with younger kids. But to keep their intention online is not easy. This is even greater for black and brown kids. An article published this week in New England Journal focuses on the impact of school closure and it showed a dramatic impact on lower socioeconomic kids and those with disabilities. The disparities in access is immense. We know that even with local experiences here in San Diego, when computers are provided, many of them go unopened and unused. That could be for social reasons. The impact of the interactions at home, lack of internet connection, other factors that can be occurring in those households. We also know that those same kids often have language barriers. We know that many of the kids in San Diego County, particularly Spanish speaking homes, may not be able to have the same access to, to appropriate education when done at home. Meal plans, which over 50% of U.S. children depend on, either fully or partially, and supplemented financially 
have been impacted. Parents, often single mothers, are forced to make choices, pay the bills or help their children at home. It's hard to do both. And now with federal assistance going down significantly, and as you know, the recent change in monies that are being supplemented to those families that are unable to work, this compounds the problem. So it is particularly important that we focus on doing the right things to allow our kids to get back to school without the risk of, risk of worsening this crisis. Getting our kids back to school has to be more important than just about anything else that we are doing in this society. But none of these things can happen with infection rates as high as they are now. If you look in San Diego County of the 104 zip codes, 19 of those have 1% rate of infection or greater. And yes, those are in predominantly South Bay areas and other areas of color. We know that Latin, Latino Americans in this city make up a good percentage of those who develop this disease. Nationwide, African Americans lead all races when it comes to getting the disease and dying from the disease. This is not because of the color of their skin, but it's because of socioeconomic issues, including living in close quarters and working conditions that contribute to this process. We're not gonna solve that overnight. That's something we have to work on in coming years. In the meantime, what can we do now? What is it that the rest of the world has done to get back to living reasonably normal lives. First of all, we have to follow the guidelines. Socially distance. Make sure that you're keeping your circles very small, mainly your family, and make sure you're washing your hands. Get tested so we'll know the incidence of asymptomatic disease in the population, which we think makes up about 40% of the disease. Look for the following symptoms. Fever, Cough, shortness of breath, loss of smell, loss of taste, diarrhea, or the typical flu symptoms that we all know. If those are persistent, you certainly should go in and get tested. But before getting tested, make sure that you distance yourself. We've now tested over 16,000 people at our two sites in Southeast San Diego, the Tupin Chavez site and the Euclid site. Be sure to go in and get tested both in symptomatic or asymptomatic, so we can understand this disease. When a safe vaccine is available, it is important that our communities get vaccinated. There's a lot of mistrust out there, but to minimize that mistrust, we have to educate ourselves with the clinical data that's presented. And once there's a safe vaccine, we are the ones that are impacted the most, so we are the ones that definitely require the vaccine immediately. Remember that we have a couple of trials that have shown significant improvement with dexamethasone and remdesivir for patients who develop this disease process in hospitalized patients. We have no data that hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin is effective when studied in a really well-controlled manner. So when you hear in the media that these things work, we have no good data to support that. For now, let's stick with what's important. Prepare ourselves for the vaccine that's coming. Mentally get ready once that safe vaccine is there to take it. Continue all the things I outlined earlier. Remember that the clinical trials will have to guide us to safe treatment strategies, including a vaccine. And only science, not politics, not anti-vaxxers or others can drive our ability to get back to a normal life. Until next time, I am Dr. G signing off. And God bless you.